it seems that the, the uh, computer in the room is not behaving as expected. Uh, anyhow, the so the self uh, self study portion is is uh, considerably. Okay, so so the objectives for the course is is uh, uh, the following. A lot of it is about the theoretical aspects. So understand some concepts, uh, study some 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 process aspects with design and evaluation methods. Uh, but then on the practical side, it's more concerned with with uh, basic software architecture design and and evaluation. Uh, uh, connected to that is a couple of design principles and of course how to describe and document software architectures so uh, in, in terms of content it's a pretty much uh, uh, a lot of introdu introductory material uh, some of it you might recognize from from uh, uh, previous software design courses uh, uh, prerequisites uh, is a lot about software design, software modeling. Uh, and now we take it to another level, more or less, uh, because uh, that is what software architecture is all about. Uh, now I see that should be the 2021 instance, because I actually updated one thing, and that is that we now have not just recorded lectures, we actually have lectures this year. Last year was uh, even more uh, well online only, but now when we plan for 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 this year, uh, we thought that the pandemic would allow us to have real lectures. But now we're somewhere in the in the in the in the middle, so one lecture per week. Uh, so there will be these lectures that we will record, uh, and then there are a couple of recorded uh, shorter ones from from uh, previous years that support you. In, in your studies, because for the self studies, we have pretty fairly extensive reading instructions uh, and a study guide for each of the seven themes that I will introduce you to uh, on the next slide. Uh, there are a couple of case studies uh, that we hopefully will extend during the year. Uh, we build one every, uh, every year, more or less. And then we have the tutoring sessions and the tutoring sessions is your opportunity to to meet your teacher face to face for 45 minutes uh, in a small group with with uh, five, six others. And, and you will have uh, lots of time to to ask your questions and get your answers. Uh, uh, but it's important that you come prepared so that you come with questions because it's not a lecture, it's a Q&A session. And then we have the examination. Uh, the book so, was a little bit on the uh, uh, we we discussed it today on 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 Slack uh, because when I when I well in 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 uh, at the university you have to be quite early uh, if you want to change a a, a syllabus and and when I checked uh, right before summer. Uh, I didn't notice that that there was a new edition of this book uh, coming out, uh, but there is a, a one that that came somewhere sometime during summer, uh, which is the the fourth edition. This is the third edition. Uh, I did. I haven't checked if if it's like one hundred percent compatible with the third edition, but I, I checked the. Uh, the subject lines in in the uh, uh, the table of contents, and it's it appears that that the, all the important chapters are are still there. Uh, so it should uh, should definitely work, uh, uh, but it might be that you guys have to uh, do some 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 uh, manual work uh, when interpreting the the. Uh, uh, study guides and and, and uh, reading instructions, but uh, in terms of uh, the 
price is somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 550 kroners, so 55 dollars, euros, whatever. Uh, uh, really, for me, it's, it's a comprehensive book, so, so it, contains, it contains a lot of material. Uh, uh, the seven themes here more or less corresponds to one or two weeks. Uh, some are just one week, others are two. Uh, the introduction to software architecture will try to, so to say, give you the basics, give you an understanding what software architecture is and how you can use it and how it's being used as, as, as part of, of, of software uh, development projects. Uh, then we focus on, on architecture requirements, because even though software architecture is a design activity, and you know from, from, from previous classes that software design, well, you try to design uh, with respect to, to a set of requirements. Well, architecture requirements are still requirements, but they have certain properties that are, are, are important because you use them to distinguish them from more regular requirements. Okay, we have a question in the room. Well, hold your horse. Well, we have, I will come back to that, but, it, but it's, it's a little bit, this is just like a, a quick glance on, on, on the content of the course here. Uh, we will spend some time on, on architectural documentation, how you create uh, tailored views. Uh, that is, uh, depending upon which aspect you want to design in a system, you need a different set of models. And if you want to convey some information to, to uh, say, C-level management, or you want to, to communicate with the developers, you will have to adjust, adjust adapt your, your, how you present uh, your design. And that is what's something that we cover in this, this part here with uh, viewpoints and views. Uh, then uh, it's a design activity. So we have design patterns in the same style as, as we have design patterns for object orientation or, or other uh, paradigms. And you will even see that some of these patterns are, you recognize them as design patterns. Uh, we talk a lot about quality attributes. Uh, so for certain qualities that there are, or has been established ways to achieve them. So for instance, if you have security and you want to, to uh, achieve uh, uh, some authorization, for instance, there are certain ways to achieve that. And so a, a uh, proven strategy, a tactic for achieving that. So in this part here, we will look at certain uh, architectural requirements, security, performance, uh, reusability, et cetera, and, and, and look at different proven ways to, to achieve this. Uh, in any design activity, reasoning is a, a, a core part. Uh, it's where you identify the alternatives for your design and you start to reason, evaluate which one is the best given your requirements and your uh, system that you're designing. And then at the end, we have a couple of recorded, pre-recorded lectures on, on various applications. So uh, there are, for instance, uh, some lectures covering uh, cloud applications where uh, have one on, on something called software product lines, which is a, a way to, to improve and increase uh, uh, reuse. There is model-driven architecture, which is a way to, to use models to, uh, you develop models and then you generate applications. 
and 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 many more and I always forget that this is actually an animation, so I know I have to click through here. So these are the seven themes. And, and for each theme, there will be a couple of lectures, recorded ones, or at least one in, 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 in the room. There will be an opportunity for tutoring, and there might be an assignment because we have four assignments and seven themes. So some of these themes will be uh, part of the examination, the home exam. Uh, I can't stress how important these are, these, these one hour uh, opportunities. I, uh, I'm sad to say that, that, that over the years, I, I have seen a pattern. And that is like the first week, uh, we have more or less full house. All groups are full. Uh, but then since we have a course in parallel, the, the uh, thesis project, people tend to make a decision. They either go for the thesis project or this course. And, and it's not impossible to do both at the same time but it requires careful planning and commitment. Uh, and, and I would say that if you participate on these and if you follow the study guides and so on, uh, well, it will provide you with a, a tempo that you can use to, 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 to schedule your work. Uh, I know that the thesis product is a little bit more difficult to schedule because that is more uh, uh, so on unknown territory, you're, you're exploring something. Here you will be provided a structure. Uh, so these are the assignments and the date for the home exam. Uh, so, and they are also on uh, the Moodle page. Uh, one on functional decomposition, one on architecture requirements one on quality attributes, and then one on, on architecture design. Um, and then we have the home exam, uh, March 21st. And uh, the home exam is in two parts. Uh, we use a quiz uh, first as a, a check, a quick check, uh, a, lot, a couple of, of uh, multiple select questions. And if you don't pass a rather uh, forgiving uh, threshold, uh, you are not allowed to continue. Uh, we use that to sort of say spare your time and, and ours. Uh, it has turned out that with this quiz, we actually uh, get a much higher throughput on the essays compared to previous. So, so there is a, 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 a real benefit from this. And, and uh, I would say that the throughput on, on the quiz is 85, 90%, and then something similar uh, for the essay. And, and it's an open book home exam, uh, but it is time limited because since we have the quiz, we know when you start because you submit the quiz. So we get a timestamp. And after that, you have your, your five hours, six hours, whatever it is to, to complete the essay. Uh, and the essay is four questions. Um, now, communication. Well, uh, Slack, uh, there is a Slack channel. Uh, there is the My Moodle page, and then we put the, the recordings on, on uh, YouTube. Um, you can already now check out the recordings that are on the playlist from previous year. Uh, we will uh, uh, highlight the new lectures in, in the theme, so you will see what's new this year, uh, but then we will compile a new playlist for you uh, for this year. Uh, I have 
two colleagues uh, on this course, Francis Palma and Nadim Abbas. Uh, they will uh, focus on uh, the tutoring and assignments and the exam. Uh, so you guys will meet them on the tutoring sessions. Uh, they will also uh, be active on, on, on Slack and in, in the Moodle forums. Uh, I'll also try to be that, but, and, and I hope that the three of us together will be quite fast at, at coming back to, to, to you guys with answers to your questions. Um, so what should you do now? after today well start with the self-studies uh have a look at the first theme uh, have a look at the the study guide for that theme uh, go through the lectures uh read the book the chapters in the book uh there are a couple of study questions in the study guide so if you start preparing answers this is so there's a way for you to actually learn something if you provide answers to these questions. Uh, well, you also start to build up a, a, some, some knowledge base that you can use for your, your studies. Um, a couple of years back, the, well, there was, we had a team of students who, who, well, they teamed up to answer these questions and then they divided the work. Uh, not a very good strategy if you want to learn. It's a nice strategy to get all the answers on paper, but you don't learn more than your part. Uh, so they had to spend, at the end of the day, I think even more time on, on, on learning and understanding the answers others had prepared. So, so um, but you can still like work together on, on the answers, but don't divide it and, and do it separate from each other. Uh, and of course, ask questions, because if you don't use us uh, as answering machines, it's, it's extremely difficult for us to help you. So, so we have this, this uh, um, idea of, of, well, like a contract. If, 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 you, if you do your part, and ask us questions, we will do everything we can to help you. But, but if, you, if you're not active, it's extremely difficult for us to, to do anything. Um, if the assignments are individual, uh, yes and no. That's a good answer. Some are, individuals, uh, are individual, are, others are not. Uh, so, uh, but we will still, so to say, uh, have an opportunity to check that what you submit is actually, you should have knowledge of, of what you submit, even though you have been uh, doing it together with someone else. This is a common question. Uh, uh, I guess that some of you uh, got information about this uh, before the course, uh, but there are always some who, who realize uh, Thursday morning that today is the first day of the course and they can't register. So, so this information is for you. Uh, if you can't register, well, you're most likely in two situations. You forgot to apply. You're not even, so to say, you haven't applied for the course. That's quite common, <laughs> believe it or not. Uh, that is a very, uh, that's a, a bit challenging uh, to sort out this late, but, but uh, you, can, you can always send me an email if, if you're not uh, ready or not, uh, if you haven't applied. But if you have applied and you're conditionally admitted, it typically means that you don't, or typically it means that you don't meet the prerequisites. And, and uh, in order to, to meet the prerequisites, uh, you have to convince me, because I'm the go, no guy, no go guy here. You have to convince me that you actually meet the prerequisites. And the only way to do that is to compile and submit 
documents and some kind of argumentation that you actually meet the prerequisites. Uh, and then you just uh, send it to me in an email. Please use the course code in the subject line. Otherwise, I might miss it. Uh, and include your some kind of identification number so I well know who uh, I'm dealing with. Uh, the sooner you do that, the better, uh, because that will uh, help us a lot. Uh, you will be uh, um, added to, to Moodle and, and all of this and that. Um, so Francis just wrote in the chat that uh, we can now open, uh, you can op go to, uh, to Moodle and, and book the tutoring hours for, for week four. So next week, what are the prerequisites? Well, you can go to the, uh, it's more or less that you should have one basic course in, in uh, object-oriented modeling and system design, and you should have one, uh, or a one basic software engineering course. There is also a, a credit uh, requirement. So, so, but you can go to the, uh, uh, university web pages, uh, just search for uh, the course code and lnu.se and you will find the, the syllabus on the, that page. Uh, and and you, can, you can look it up there. You don't need the course book necessarily for, for the first assignment. Uh, this is a, a question here in, in, in the chat. Uh, so I believe that you can, you can do most of it. Uh, 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 you should be able to do it uh, without uh, the course book. Uh, because the, the first chapters in the introduction is, is mainly theoretical. Whereas the first assignment is like a, a soft uh, warm up uh, assignment. So that's about it for the introduction. And uh, I will now try to, to uh, sort of say, provide an argument why software architecture is actually uh, something useful. I will also try to explain what it is and, and uh, how you may use it. And it will also give you some structure uh, to what you saw previously in the themes, because this uh, presentation here connects uh, pretty well to the, the themes. Uh, yes, you, there is, a, well, you, of course you can find the book online as well. And I hope you mean uh, online bookstore here, uh, because it's, it's not, uh, I know the guys who, who wrote the book and I think they deserve some money for, for all the work they put into it. Uh, there is, as far as I know, no implementation required. Uh, uh, yes, of course, eBooks, I, eBooks are good. So buy eBooks online. Uh, uh, Francis, you have to help me out here. There is no implementation in, in any one of the assignments. No, no. Oh. So, so it's design exercises. So, why software architecture? Well, uh, developing software is 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 about making decisions, a lot of decisions. Um, first, you 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 start to collect, and then you try to understand the requirements. And part of this is actually to make decisions. Uh, as part of the implementation, because sometimes you have to, to uh, decide what a requirement should be. You have to limit, you have to uh, uh, interpret you, different users and make a decision that this is actually something we can do, but we don't do this. Uh, And when you have a set of requirements, well, you start to, to, to for each and every 
uh, requirements, you start to think about, okay, how should we realize these? How can we uh, implement these in a system? And that step is the design activity where you take the requirements and try to envision a system. At the very start, a rough drawing of a system, and then you gradually improve, gradually refine, add details, add more information to your design. And then at some point, you also start to implement parts of it. And then you, well, iteratively and incrementally construct your system. So design is an ongoing activity that runs in parallel to implementation and testing and all this and that. But along the road here, you make a lot of decisions. But the thing here is that, that some decisions are different than others. Because some decisions have an impact on a large part of the system, whereas other decisions have just a very local impact. So for instance, if you decide to use a for or a while loop, that is a design decision. But it has an extremely local impact. Compare that to uh, if you're going to use a uh, uh, Amazon Web Services or run it on your own self-hosted machines. That is an architectural decision. So you see the, the scale here of the, or the imp relative importance of the decision. The while or for loop, well, it concerns a developer, but the AWS or, well, self-hosted, that has a huge impact on more or less the entire development. So there are some classes of decisions that are different in the sense that they have this global impact. And it doesn't mean that it affects the entire system, but a large chunk of the system. And someone might argue that, okay, but I can, I can develop a, a system, system on AWS myself. I can do this on my own in a, in a one-man project. Is it still an architectural decision? Because it just impacts me. I'm, I'm the only developer. Yes, it does, because it's, it impacts how the system is structured. But then we have this uh, team size, because it adds a problem to the, to the story here. And that is, that is communication. Uh, you know that, that, so we have 10 people in the room more or less, uh, 11 with me. Uh, we are a fairly small team. Uh, but the benefit with the team is that you can uh, divide work into chunks and have uh, smaller groups have a go at the chunks uh, in parallel. And hopefully we can speed up. And then at the end of the day, we can meet up and uh, bring our solutions back together. And by some magic, hopefully it will work. But in order to, uh, to be able to do that, we have to agree on some things before we uh, fork out into our subgroups. These decisions, compare that to a development project, these decisions are made early in the project. Before we go out, divide work into to sub on, 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 and delegate to sub teams. That is another aspect of architectural significance because we have to agree early 
And uh, the AWS is, is one example. If we uh, postpone that decision until the end of the project, it's probably too late. We have to do that before the subgroups start to work. So, so we have to just make these architectural decisions that is more on like the, the infrastructure or the software uh, early in the project. And that is another property for an architect, architectural decision. The relative significance and also that often it's, it's made early in the, the uh, design uh, and development process. But early in the uh, design process, we don't have much implemented, do we? Even though we use these uh, incremental uh, iterative development approaches, we don't have much. So testing is hard. If we don't have a system, it's difficult to test. Uh, we could use testing uh, as an approach to, to evaluate design options. So is A better than B? Well, we can implement A and we can implement B and we can compare, but it's quite costly. So architecture design plays a role here because it enables us to start reasoning about alternatives at the model level. We don't need the implementation. We don't need the code. We can actually reason about performance at the level of a model. We can reason about security at the model level. So the benefit here is that we can make decisions at this level and then go on with the implementation. We don't have to create a lot of waste by implement and then discard. So this is an important role of software architecture to enable designers, architects, to reason about their design and design alternatives and make informed decisions. What you see here is more or less 95% of the course on one slide. It's architecture design and I could actually, uh, if I wanted to, I can just uh, see if I have some. In principle, we could just remove the architecture here because this is this is software design or design of anything. It could be a tangible, tangible thing. You have on the left hand side something that we call concerns, and it's more or less a category of requirements. So you have the ASR architectural significant architecture significant requirements. So requirements that are at the architectural level. The architect collects and specifies these. And then for each and every uh, concern, they have to come up with a design. So what is the design for, for security? What is the design that guarantees performance? What is the design that provides the functionality to the end users. Doing that, well, the architect uses knowledge, his or hers knowledge from previous design projects. Uh, so experience, but they also use packaged knowledge uh, like design patterns, architecture patterns, tactics and also something called reference architectures that we will talk more about in a couple of lectures. And they also use other, or other systems as inspiration. So uh, if someone has 
done something that is fairly similar to what you're supposed to do, well, that's a good source of inspiration if it's done well, of course. It's also good to identify how you shouldn't do it. And then you use the knowledge uh, to uh, uh, get your options in place and then you can start to evaluate options and then you can make decisions and the decision results in a strategy and a strategy is a set of design decisions that is we if it comes to security for instance our uh, uh, authentication mechanism works like this our session management works like this uh, we store user information here. We communicate all information well, using this uh, encryption technology. So decisions that are important for a large part of the system. And that's a strategy that is, so to say, designed because there are different alternatives and the different alternatives have different, so to say, properties, good or bad. And the architect's responsibility is to balance and find the best mix to meet the requirements in the concerns raised by the system stakeholders. Okay, I think it's a good time for a short break here. Uh, so uh, let's take 10 minutes and we start uh, five minutes past the hour. Okay, good.
Okay, uh, so uh, we have uh, uh, started again. Uh, just uh, hope you can hear me online as well. Uh, so uh, good. In order to to uh, well illustrate the the uh, process I, I showed you in the previous uh, slide well we can have a look at a, a, a uh, some examples from from uh, a case study that we developed uh, as well it has a few years uh, and the actual software has developed a lot but but the basics is still there uh, so it is a, a platform for for home automation uh, so uh, sensors and actuators and, and dashboards and, and stuff like that. Uh, something that brings different types of services together. Uh, it is an interesting uh, area because it, it is uh, quite easy to grasp for, for most people. Uh, uh, it's uh, not too uncommon to, to uh, uh, have some kind of uh, devices, uh, a cell phone, a smartwatch, or uh, uh, some, some uh, uh, Google or Apple or uh, uh, Amazon device in your house uh, that you can use as a hub to connect uh, different sensors and so on. Uh, so I actually managed to explain this to, to my, my big sister once, which was a, a great achievement in my opinion. Uh, but a smart home infrastructure, what is the problem here? Well, you have, uh, you have a lot of things. And, and what's typical for these things? Well, they come from different manufacturers. And uh, they also do different things or are capable of doing different things. Uh, what's common here is more or less that they are somehow connected to a network. And uh, they connect to some infrastructure. And this might be a gateway that, is, so to say, takes care of the communication uh, for the things. And it might be a gateway that connects the things to some cloud application or some network application, I should say. Um, and then based on the infrastructure, you can build ser services and applications. You can build something that looks like a, a, a dashboard, uh, for instance, with uh, different uh, uh, widgets uh, to, to interact or, or set uh, values you can actuate or you can inspect values to, to figure out uh, what the temperature is on the attic or whatever you're interested in. Uh, but what is really the, the difficulty if you would like to develop a system that can support connecting things to some services that you develop and you use them to build applications and then you have some infrastructure in the middle. Well, for OpenHab, they, they formulated as, as some main technical challenges and that is to provide interoperable APIs and data models for infrastructure operators, uh, service and device providers. So in order to connect the things to the uh, infrastructure, there must be some kind of agreement, okay? Some program API for, for uh, uh, invoking functionality at the various levels, and of course, data models to exchange information. That is like a basic understanding. 
And this will be part of the platform. You have to develop these, these common ground, this common ground for, for the operators and, and providers of services and devices. Then, in order to, to, uh, to build the applications, like a dashboard, well, you need some, some platform for the end users to uh, integrate devices at that level and use some kind of uh, rule-based automation to uh, uh, collect data from the things and send out instructions to actuate on the things. And then also have some opportunity to, to provide uh, a user interface that is programmable or configurable so that they can create personalized, uh, tailor their own dashboards, for instance. So if these are the main technical challenges, I'm not sure, but, but I see that, well, you can do this in a couple, you can do this in many different ways. There is not just one solution here. There are a lot of solutions. But the question is, of course, which one is the best one? Well, that is difficult. But is there one that is good enough? You know, we're engineers, so we settle for that. Good enough. Satisfy the customer. Well, there are a couple of options that will get us to good enough. Uh, if you go to the architecture design, start with these uh, technical challenges here on the right. You might use them, you can use them to derive some of the, the concerns you have to manage as an architect. Interoperable. Something that is interoperable between the infrastructure operators and service and device providers. Okay, some interoperability. It sounds like a, a, something that is a concern for a large part of the system, it contains a set of architectural significant requirements. Then we have a platform that supports device integration. Okay, a device can be a lot of things, different things from different vendors. We need this common understanding. Well, that's, it seems like a decision that affects a large part of the system, okay? So, and the same with the rule-based automation and also to some extent, maybe the configurable user interface. But what you can do here is that you can actually derive a couple of concerns from these technical challenges. And besides the one you find here, I always add security because if, if we have a system where you can connect things, you don't want to connect anything to that one. There must be some kind of level of security in the system. And of course, performance is, is uh, at least to some of these applications key. Uh, there must be some guarantees that, that uh, your, uh, uh, the frequency where you, uh, uh, so to say, check for updates and so on, on sensor values and, and your things and so on, are, are, are met. These, there could be some, some time criticality here. But when it comes to performance, it's also about uh, memory performance because some of these devices are pretty small uh, and some of them are, are limited in, in uh, uh, well, you can't load a network if you have a small battery uh, uh, run sensor, for instance, you have to be a little bit careful here. So, so these will result in a couple of concerns. There are more than, than these, but I, I just put them here. So a concern is a category of requirements that is important to one or more stakeholders. So uh, 
For instance, interoperability is relevant for the platform operators or the infrastructure operators, I should say. It's important for the device uh, providers and it's important for the end users. Security is also important for these or relevant, interesting. It could also be something that is just of interest to, to one. Automation, for instance, uh, if you have automation rules that, that might be just relevant to the end user. They want to set up rules to, to, to uh, harvest data from, from different things and maybe enact uh, some, some changes on, on, on SOP. So, When we have these concerns, okay, we can start to analyze these concerns and start to, to detail them and, and turn them into a set of architectural significant requirements, ASRs. Uh, and an architectural significant requirement has a profound effect on the architecture. If it wasn't there, the architecture would diff look different. Uh, we will come back to, and you will see examples of architectural significant requirements in, I think, like a couple of weeks. But, but the idea here is that for each and every concern, well, there will be at least one architecture significant requirements. Requirement, I should say. So there will be performance requirements, there will be security requirements, et cetera, et cetera. And now we come to the interesting thing here, and that's the architecture decisions. So now we have architecture concerns, we have architecture requirements, and suddenly, well, the decisions we make about these architectural requirements in order to realize them, well, that's our architecture decision. In principle, one could use this distinction here. It has some global impact, which is opposite, well, I use local as opposite, but, but global can be part of a system. It doesn't have to be the entire system. There are more information on this in, in the other lectures in this theme. So you will, uh, this is just like scratching the surface of this topic here. But let's go to, to uh, interoperability and configurability. Uh, well, the things here, the things, we can't do too much about the things because the, the, those are provided by, by other vendors. Uh, but what we have to do is to, to, to come up with an idea for the APIs and the data models that, that connects our platform with the, uh, where we integrate uh, things and where we create the rules and where we, uh, well, design the services and applications. So, so one of the architecturally significant uh, aspects here, the concerns are interoperability and configurability, and it focuses on this part here, the design of this, this, this part of our platform. How should we do this? How should we connect things to our platform? How should we support uh, us invoking services in the things and the things invoking services in the platform? How should we develop, well, how should we be able to, to collect data to the platform and maybe reflect data from the platform down to the thing? This is definitely something that requires quite some 
design work. Because what we would like to see here in addition is for instance, uh, it should be plug and play. So we shouldn't have to, well, reboot the system. Uh, it would be uh, quite annoying if you, whenever you, uh, so to say, connect your cell phone to your car, you have to turn it off and start it again. The same here, if you, if you buy an, uh, a new light bulb here, a connected one, if you have to turn down your home automation system and then bring it back up again, just because you added a thing, nah, won't work. But it's an option. It's still an option. You can, you can develop a system that requires the system owner to do that. You can also have a, a, a system where you, so there's a hard code devices. So you can, you can hard code, okay, so this is a, a fridge from uh, uh, Siemens. Uh, uh, it has this API and the data looks like this. So we provide an integration for this device. That's one way to do it. Uh, but then it requires that someone takes care of, of developing these templates for the things. So someone has to come up with a light bulb here and if the API changes, well, you have, well, hmm. Can we do something else? Well, of course we can have an additional layer on top of things where we actually uh, uh, create an abstraction of the thing underneath. So we separate the interface from its implementation. Okay, so now we have not just two options when it comes to the separation to allow configurability. We also have the option if we want to bring the system down to reboot it or not. So you can start adding design challenges here that comes from the architectural significant requirements. So the how here is important. How can you do that? Well, now we're in uh, figuring out which options we have. The so number two here, what are the options? In order to, to, to achieve this interoperability, what can we do? Well, in order to figure that out, well, knowledge is, is good our own experience and experience from others. And we use these options to uh, make sort of a conceptual mock-ups where we, uh, okay, we can do this here, but then that would require that we do a reboot. Is that good enough? No, we, we discard that one. But if we do it like this, well, that will be a hot plug and play. That's much better. Okay, we use that. So you can start to reason about the design options and make decisions that are a little bit more informed than if you didn't do this in this way. This is called architectural reasoning, where you take your options, you evaluate them, you make a decision based on this evaluation. And the evaluation can be like what I just did. Do we think that end users would like to reboot the system? No, we can just throw that into the bin in, in, in two seconds. But if we start to think about, okay, but this solution here where we have this level of abstraction and indirection with an abstract interface and an implementation, we all know that each level of indirection, uh, well, that's a performance penalty. Uh, so can we satisfy the performance requirement with this solution? Hmm, that is something that you have to take into account when you reason about your options. Not that you just meet one of the requirements, but all requirements that are, so to say, affected by your decision. 
And the output of the reasoning design activity here is a strategy. A strategy for interoperability, a strategy for configurability, a strategy for security. And this strategy here include descriptions of the solutions with respect to the architectural significant requirements. So uh, for instance here, one architecture decision could be that we used architectural pattern, the event bus here. Event bus is uh, uh, pretty much a, a, a simple publish and subscribe uh, pattern where you have publishers that publishes or publishers that register themselves to the uh, event bus. And then you have subscribers that subscribes to that publisher. And by that, you can have a refrigerator down here. This one, oops, sorry. Uh, this one here that registers in the bus. And then we have something up here that subscribes to that. So this is a fairly static view. And, and then you can, in your strategy, of course, in the same way when you, as when you design an object-oriented system, you have a class model, you have your sequence diagrams, et cetera, et cetera. Well, you can do it here as well. So uh, this is a dynamic description model for, for uh, publish, uh, subscribe uh, pattern. Uh, asynchronous communication, that's nice. Uh, because then we don't need uh, knowledge about how to communicate. The thing doesn't know how to communicate with the inner components of the platform, and the platform doesn't know how to communicate directly with the, uh, the thing. It, there is like an abstraction in between. That means that you can plug and unplug and with less uh, problems. Uh, this is another design decision, of course. We could have synchronous communication, which means that everybody that communicates knows about each other. So there is, okay, I communicate with you, you communicate to me, but we have to be online both. This recording here would be asynchronous communication. Uh, so things communication, then the second one here is uh, that we use bindings. And this is the abstraction. Remember, we add the thing here. And for each of the thing, we create a binding, which is the, so to say, endpoint for, for the communication from the platform side. So the platform never communicates with the device or the thing, it communicates to the binding and the binding furthers the, the communication to the thing or back. So uh, you can look up more information about this, this little uh, platform in the, the uh, uh, case study that we will publish uh, is a couple of, I think four, three, four recordings dif describing different aspects of it. Uh, it's based on, on, a, on a platform called from, from the Eclipse family. But uh, you see the difference here now between, between like deciding how, the, how to implement things inside here, the binding, that is a local decision. But, but setting up the, the infrastructure here 
that's the architecture level. Uh, the last part that I didn't show you uh, before is the view or the views here, because uh, for your concerns, you have to document your decisions. You have to document your strategy. And the strategies are documented in, in, in one or more views. And a view is a set of models, a document, a document. So text, diagrams, calculations, everything you need to communicate with the stakeholder. But you can't create one view and communicate with everyone. So if I want to communicate with the C-level management, like the vice president or whatever it is of technology, uh, well, then I have to design, put, well, put one view together that is more directed towards that level. Whereas if I, if I want to convince my, my testers that this is what the, the security strategy looked like, and please come up with some decent uh, test strategy for this, well then, well, the view looks different. The, the, the information is completely different or not completely, but, but it's much more detailed. You provide information that you never, so to say, send upstream. So, so what you see here is more or less themes two, three, four, five, and six. So the entire course on one side. So identify stakeholders and their concerns. So you get, a, you get a challenge, design the system. Okay, what is important here? How do we store data? How do we communicate data? Uh, what about security? How should we partition the system? Is there a, a structure where we have servers and clients, or do we have some peers, and do we have different architectures? Do we have cell phones? Do we have iPads? Do we have Android? Do we have, well, concerns. For each of and every concern, talk to the state stakeholders, identify the architectural significant requirements, and when that's done, you can start your design activity. It's not something that you do and then it's done. It's something that it's done throughout the project because we work incrementally, iteratively. It means that you always have to come back and refine and review and integrate and add some more design to your... So that is a challenge per se, but uh, that's what makes this job so fun. The challenge. And then you document everything in a view or a couple of views. So that's about it. And uh, there is one thing that I, one more thing that I often hear from students in this class, and that is since, well, uh, Francis answered a question before no implementation. There is no implementation in this course. And I know that some of you struggle with that because some of these things are abstract, but it is abstract. It's, if you want to reason about, should we deal with, uh, should we use uh, AWS or should we do something uh, uh, self-hosted, develop our own uh, platform, whatever? Well, that is not easy for you guys to reason about. Uh, if we talk about security, there are so many different options, but you're not experts in all these options. So, so it becomes difficult, it becomes challenging. But this is part of, the, part of the game here because we will have architects focusing on performance. We will have architects focusing on security. We will have specialists in many of these concerns. 
because that's the sort of say knowledge depth required to make these decisions to be able to reason about it but you have to learn how to crawl before you can walk and run so you have to start somewhere and this is what we do here we make a lot of assumptions we don't require that you make the right decisions but you should make the wrong decisions right if you understand what i mean uh so so it's important that you reason about things but the conclusions are not necessarily important uh and that you follow the recipe so uh that's a bit about it for today uh we have a question in the room uh before at least today uh no i i general i i usually a little bit more ahead of time than today uh today i i think i posted them before lunch uh, so yes uh all other lecture notes from previous years are already there for theme one and we will start adding theme two three four five six in the next few days uh the reason why they're not up there is that we need to to uh there is some housekeeping <laughs> we need to clean them up uh and and remove material that is not uh, valid for this year and so on. It takes some time, uh, but usually day two before. Another question in the room? Uh, yeah, about the significance requirements. Yeah. Do they also include, include like functional requirements or are they like mostly non functional? Uh, so the question was about architectural significant requirements. Uh, if they, I would say, they can yes uh so so for instance this uh this configurability uh the end user should be able to uh uh so do they connect a service to a user interface component with the rule uh that connects to possibly multiple devices that 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 at some level it's a functional requirement because it's an end user requirement but it's also quality so so it, it's difficult to say if it's yes or no but uh, in that case i would say definitely function for for a function in the system that is architecturally significant but 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 like deciding or providing the opportunity to set the color of the widget to blue green or yellow that's not architecturally significant uh, like uh, reason about the decisions no what to, you know typically what what you see here is is uh the architectural design if you if you think about a, a a development process if you have an agile process for instance you know you you work iteratively you work incrementally which means that you have a backlog and it could be that some of the sprints early on focus on on uh, uh, setting up the the architecture so to say and you can even have have a uh, architectural spikes that that look into uh, certain architectural uh, alter options and evaluate them. But um, so I would say that that early in early in a in the development uh, in the project you work more on the architectural significant requirements than later in the project because you uh to to develop your what to you say minimum minimal viable product that they use in, in agile development the, the the smallest usable product that provides some 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 value to a user well you need to have some architecture in place. So, so in order for for the connecting the things, etc., maybe I 
what what would be the minim, minimal viable product here uh be able to connect a, a thing uh do something com in terms of communication uh maybe not necessarily a ui configurable all that could come later so so but there is some some so to say architecturally significant work early in 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 well at the top of your backlog early in the project so so Yeah. Yeah. Where would you do that? For example, in the open top example, where would that be in the process? Where you like define the API? How the API? Uh, well, I would put it, it if you have an ad. So the question was about well, where would we design the APIs and 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 so on and so forth. So so I would say that that is a that is something that ends up in the backlog. That, that is something that, that, well, you have to, well, you have to do, you have to put it somewhere and it's, it's, it's not, it's not a, it's not a development phase. It's an, it's an activity in the same way as, as testing or, or implementation, whatever it's, it's, it's like intertwined with all other activities, but, but in order to explain it i factor it out so it might look like a separate process but but uh so hopefully it will be a little bit more clear when you start working with it do we have yeah i'm just taking the okay no a question in the room yes yeah yeah I also do tutoring. Yes, you're so many that we have to do that. No, but it's it's uh, it's nice to uh, um, it's more more fun to do tut tutoring than lecturing. <laughs> I put it like that. So, okay, uh, I think we're running up out of questions. Uh, how many retakes for the assignments and exam do we have this year? How many do you need? uh usually it's it's uh three yes <laughs> provide the answer here good uh so there is a retake uh, close to the assignment we and usually we bundle them so that there is a retake for all assignments uh close to the the uh, uh home exam retake and then there is one opportunity in august too Hope we don't need Sorry, more. I have than, uh, one more question. One. If you no, have I I know that Nadim and Francis also keep their fingers crossed that you don't need more than one. <laughs> so, uh, okay, I think that's it. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, see you guys uh, next week. Take care.